Now we're coming to an end to both Michael and Roberta Finlay's sexploitation films and the end of sexploitation films in general. At least to a certain extent. In 1969, the year that this came out, Andy Warhol released his Blue movie, which was the first widely released movie that contained explicit depictions of sex. Other movies that did similar things came out soon after. Uh, Mona came out in 1970, uh, Deep Throat, uh, which <laughs> you've probably heard of that one, uh, that one came out in 72, I believe, and yeah, the golden age of porn had arrived and the sexploitation films basically disappeared. The role that sexploitation films had played was now being filled by something else. Movies became explicit and the fun stopped. But of course, that's not entirely true. Uh, in 1973, the Supreme Court handed down a ruling that gave local governments the power to outlaw porn theaters, uh, which they did. Uh, this did kind of create a new market, though, for the sexploiteers to once again uh, make uh, sexy movies uh, to make money, uh, which they did. But that's also kind of a conversation for a different time. Uh, let's see how Michael and Roberta Finlay go out. Maybe they go out on top. Welcome to Exploitation Reviews, and me, Rob. Today I'm taking a look at The Ultimate Degenerate from 1969. This is the last of Michael Finlay's sick and sexy sexploitation sickies from the 60s. This film revolves around Maria, played by Finlay regular Uta Eriksson, who we last saw in A Thousand Pleasures, and was the main character in The Kiss of Her Flesh. Here she plays an exhibitionist lesbian looking for a more fulfilling, uh, that is, a kinkier life. After an argument with her girlfriend, who we know as Buberella, uh, she calls an ad in a local newspaper that's looking for mm, performers of a sort. The performances involve sex, which she wants, and the pay is $500 a week, which is just a nice bonus. All of this is organized by Spencer, who we'll meet a bit later. Uh, first, we meet Spencer's talent scout. Uh, this is uh, Earl Hinman, uh, who we also saw in The Kiss of Her Flesh. He checks Maria out, likes her well enough, and takes her to Spencer's place. Upon arrival, he takes her first to the basement where there's a stage, and on that stage are three lovely women uh, spraying each other down with uh, whipping cream. Uh, <laughs> and they're all completely naked, and it's pretty awesome, and I'm not going to show you any of it. Too bad, though, because the music also is really good. And the whipped cream sprayed jiggly bits, of course. And then finally we meet Spencer, and hey, look, it's Michael Finlay. Uh, that's probably not much of a surprise. Spencer shoots Maria up with a aphrodisiac of his own concoction. Uh, that, that, that was a bit of a surprise for me, actually. After testing the concoction out with Bruno, Spencer explains how the house works. Uh, downstairs, there's a stage uh, where the performers uh, practice their shows. And upstairs, uh, all the girls can stay in their own room and do whatever they want up there. But on the way up to Maria's room, Bruno tells her that the shows that Spencer is organizing uh, you know, they never get performed. Uh, the people he shows them to don't exist. Uh, Spencer is quite insane. Uh, I guess that shouldn't be much of a surprise. Maria settles in and gets to know uh, some of the girls, and then we get our first hint of drama. I just brought a new girl up. Maybe she'll work out. Yeah, don't call me here. You'll hear from me. Hmm, the plot thickens. Who's he talking to? Who is this Helen? During a rather hot dance number, uh, Spencer takes some drug that puts him in a kind of a trance, I don't know, maybe H, uh, and then Bruno takes that opportunity to spit in his face. I guess he doesn't like him. Nope, definitely doesn't like him. He mixes a different kind of drug into Maria's aphrodisiac. Uh, he's got some sort of plan cooking. We're about to find out what it is. She thinks Spencer's gonna kill her. <laughs> I substituted a triple so Spencer thinks he gave her his aphrodisiac. When she wakes up, she'll be another person. No telling what she may do. <laughs>
And when Maria gets her next hit of aphrodisiac, things take a psychedelic and rather cool turn. Maria hallucinates that Spencer is somehow orchestrating the killing of the girls, uh, including her girlfriend from the beginning, Booberella. I can't show you much of these scenes because everyone in them is naked. It is really cool though, and the gas mask wearing killers are pretty freaky. This is a pretty cool scene. Totally weird, pretty cool. Eventually, Maria grabs a big fork of some sort and skewers Spencer. And then we finally get to see who Bruno has been conspiring with this whole time. Hello, Helen. Are you ready to come over? Oh, Bruni, how did you get rid of all those horrible girls? What? And also, okay, whatever. And that's the movie. Uh, let's talk some highlights. Well, the highlights here are similar to the highlights of all of Michael Finlay's other exploitation films. There are uh, quite a few uh, gorgeous women here, and they spend quite a bit of time out of their clothes. There's also some pretty trippy violence. Gotta love trippy violence. One particular highlight of The Ultimate Degenerate, though, is the music. This is by far uh, the best uh, soundtrack of any of Michael Finlay's movies. Uh, there are some really just legitimately cool tunes here. One of the tunes is Is It On, Is It Off by The Bit of Sweet, and that is a really great song. And the ending's pretty cool, that sort of psychedelic, like, gas mask wearing killer ending. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Like, very cool. But the film's not perfect. Uh, like a new girl hopped up on experimental aphrodisiac, it has some shortcomings. Well, on the production side of things, this film is considerably worse than most of the other ones in Michael Finlay's uh, 60s canon. Uh, it is plagued by audio issues in particular. Uh, sometimes the audio doesn't match what's going on the screen, uh, and other times it's clear they just didn't have the line recorded that they needed, and then Michael Finlay had to record it later and then dub it over a different character's voice. It's pretty bad. Meet me at Coney Island. Corner of Stillwell and Ocean. Okay. But I can also kind of forgive it. I mean, this is super low-budget filmmaking right here. My main complaint is there's just not enough of Michael Finlay. Uh, he's not the main antagonist here. Um, I mean, he is an antagonist, uh, but he's not like the main character by any stretch. Uh, this is Bruno's movie. He's the one calling the shots. Uh, he's the one pushing the plot forward. And he's fine, uh, but he's not Michael Finlay. Like, not even close. Overall, I guess this film just isn't quite as wild uh, or engaging enough to be worth watching uh, if uh, you've already watched uh, The Touch of Her Flesh or any of the Flesh movies um, or, you know, maybe like A Thousand Pleasures. If you've seen those four movies, there's not a whole lot here that's going to be of great interest. Uh, unless you just want more of the same. But actually, maybe that's kind of a positive of the film, if I think about it. Uh, maybe you thought that the Flesh trilogy was a bit too sadistic and A Thousand Pleasures was a bit too fetishistic. Uh, if that's the case, uh, maybe this film hits that sweet spot. I mean, in the context of 60s exploitation films, uh, this has more nudity than any of the Olga films. Uh, it's got some pretty great music, and it's not quite as, you know, nasty as the Flesh trilogy, so yeah, uh, this might be your movie. And there we are, that's the end of Finlay February. Uh, so, how does the Finlay story end? Well, like I said at the top of the video, the era of sexploitation films was coming to an end. The low-budget filmmakers who were still making money in the early to mid-70s uh, were making that money either doing horror films or hardcore pornography. Um, and the Finlays did try their hand at both of these things. But not to much success. Sometime in the early to mid-70s, Roberta left Michael. Uh, according to an interview I read, uh, she doesn't even know why. She just left. Uh, she did continue to make movies. Uh, she made movies uh, through the 80s. Uh, some of them are pretty good, actually. Uh, she did some hardcore stuff uh, that I won't review on this channel, uh, but did some kind of horror things uh, that I will, uh, one of which uh, probably very soon. 
Yeah, and then in the late 80s, she retired from filmmaking. So, yeah, not a bad career, I guess. Michael's end, though, is considerably more depressing. Uh, he never really achieved any kind of success after the exploitation films that I've talked about this month. Um, and, yeah, he was pretty poor. Uh, at one point, he even called uh, Roberta and asked for money. Uh, she said it was rather sad. Things were starting to look up for him, though. He invented a new kind of 3D camera, and he was on his way to France, I believe, to show the camera to some financial backers uh, when he died in a helicopter accident. It was 1977, and he was only 39 years old. He had made some insane and, in my mind, rather fascinating movies, but died poor and relatively unknown. But that's how it goes sometimes. Sometimes people produce things and never find an audience large enough to make producing those things worth the effort. Mm -hmm.